Hello, everyone. You're 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 very welcome. We can see the the room is filling up now, and uh, we have well over um a hundred people signed up for today's webinar. So we'll give them another couple of minutes to see if a few more people join the room. Um, I'll start with a few introductions. So my name is Ruth Doyle. And I am part of a broader team, including Chris O'Keefe and Africa on the call today, and we are moderating today's session. So we work for a company called Emco, and we're part of a broader consortium on the Living Streets Dunleary project, which is what we're all here to talk about today. Uh, the consortium is led by Barry Transportation, and we have Rory Collins here today from the team. Um, we today is really just about giving you guys an overview and a better understanding of what the Living Streets Dunleary project is about. So it's currently out for part eight consultation. And this webinar is to give you a better idea of all the different elements of the project. It's a big project. We've been working on it for the last year or so. And we really want you to get a good sense of what it will mean for you and what it will mean for Dunleary. So myself and Chris and Afric will moderate the session and we've got Connor here who will give an overview of the, the background on the project and then John and Rory will go into the detailed designs. So as I said, the Part A consultation is live at the moment. It's a six week consultation period and it'll be open for submissions until the 14th of December. So today we're going to be giving you more detail on the project and it's really about clarifying any queries that you have so that you can make a more informed submission. And we would encourage everyone who's here today uh, to go and complete the online submission if you haven't done so already. And hopefully today will give make you feel more equipped to do that and, and to do that confidently. So to put questions to the panelists, there is uh, the, we're going to use the chat function. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Zoom, but that's the little chat icon down the bottom black strip of your screen. You can put questions to the panelists throughout the session and as, as they come to your to, to, to your head. But we will go through them at the end of the session. So myself and Chris and Africa will be compiling and, and trying to kind of group all the questions and get through as many as we can today. I'm sure people will have plenty to say and we'll have quite plenty of queries. So we will go through the presentations first, but please do put the questions into the chat as they come to mind. We will be recording the session today so it can live online and people can watch it back for further information. So as I said, we'll have sort of three main parts to the, to the webinar. First, Connor Garrity, who's the senior engineer from Dunleary Ratdown County Council and the manager of this project, is going to give an overview of the evolution of the project and the background and why it's being proposed. Next, we're going to go on to John Montgomery from NMP, who are the lead landscape architects on the project. And John is going to give you an overview of all the designs for Dunleary Town, the pedestrian extent and Clorinda Park. And then we'll go on to Rory Collins from Barry Transportation Limited, who's going to talk about some of the traffic modelling and the modal filters um, and aspects of wayfinding with respect to the project. And then lastly, that'll probably take about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, we'll go on to questions. So I'll hand over to Connor Garrity now, who's going to give you uh, an overview of the background. Thanks, Ruth, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for making the time this evening to come to this webinar. I suppose at the very highest level or more of a vision statement for the scheme, the Living Streets to Leary project is, is a scheme that involves sustainable mobility and public realm improvements. I suppose that's at a high level. And what we're trying to do is to make uh, Dunleary Town and the local streets in its environs safer and greener to connect the communities and to keep the economy vibrant. And the reason we've arrived at that uh, decision, I suppose, maybe taking a step back from Dunleary, there's been a huge amount of work uh, in the area over the last three years. <clears throat> this map uh, shows a number of things. So the blue outline is the Dunleary decarbonising zone um, that was set down in our climate action plan. And the routes in green are schemes that are either under construction um, or have planning approval in the last three years. So there's been a huge amount of work done on uh, facilities, particularly active travel facilities. Uh, the most recent part eight being the Rochestown Avenue part eight. So when it comes to Dunleary Town, the, the discussion around how best to make connections from these active travel facilities into the town. And that was the genesis of this project. And it evolved, um, or sorry, and 
before we get into the evolution of it, there was a number of project aims that were set down at the start that were guiding decisions as we went through it. So there, there were six objectives or project aims, <clears throat> and they are to make safe walking and cycling an option within the Living Streets block to improve connections between bus, rail and active travel facilities. And, and that's to make it easier to, for people to get around to improve the environment by reducing traffic and related noise and air pollution um, and in, increase planting in public space. And this would be in line with our climate change and biodiversity objectives. It's to promote equitable travel options and urban design that creates a safe and welcoming experience for all members of society, regardless of their age, gender, ability or income. To enhance the economic vibrancy of the town as a mixed use town and its attractiveness as a destination by facilitating the sustainable and efficient movement of people and goods and by creating an environment that people want to linger in. So whatever mode you choose to travel in, the option would be available for you to come to Dunleary. And when you get there, that the public realm will be set up in a way that would encourage you to stay and linger and spend more time in the town. Uh, and then the, the final objective is to promote health and well-being in the community by in, enabling safer active travel. And to, to enable this, there's a number of um, there's a number of measures being proposed. So landscaping upgrades for the town, which include planting, seating, accessible urban design, and an improved pedestrian environment. And John is going to talk a little bit more about the detail of that. The pedestrianisation of Georgia Street Lower, which would be from Patrick Street down to what, what is now Myrtle Square. Um, and that is a similar extent that was done during the Summer Streets uh, trial pedestrianisation in 2021. The Living Streets neighbourhood then is the wider block. Um, and within that, we're proposing quieter and safer streets uh, to facilitate that. It's, we're proposing three modal filters, which will remove strategic or through traffic while still maintaining destination traffic. And, and the benefit of this is that it reduces the volume of traffic to a level that enables it to be a safer way area to walk and cycle in. Um, rather than having to put dedicated cycle facilities so there is no loss of parking in these areas. We're proposing sustainable mobility improvements, <clears throat> and that's particularly around safer walking environment and connecting to the wider active travel network that I spoke about at the start. So Rory is going to talk a little bit about wayfinding and signposting, um, but there are a number of initiatives included in the project, um, primarily to help people wayfind if you're coming to Dunleary in vehicles, um, and, and Rory will pick up on that later. So as an overview in the project, what's proposed, and I mentioned this, is that the pedestrianisation, um, a permanent pedestrianisation of Georgia Street from Patrick Square, from Patrick Street to Myrtle Square, three modal filters. So one on Cross Avenue, just west of Patrick Street, a modal filter on Tivoli Road, west of Patrick Street, and a modal filter in Clorinda Park. And in addition to those mobility changes, we're also proposing um, a, an improvement to the park in Clorinda, which uh, John will touch on. So we have a fly through video that we've done and it's a 3D rendered model of what's proposed. So I'm not I'm not going to show it this evening because it's too long for the purpose of the webinar, but just to let you know that it exists and it's available on our website. So it does, it, it's designed um, in line with what the proposed project is. So it's a useful guide if you're trying to figure out um, what's proposed on each or any particular street. So looking at, at the history of the project, so it's been set down in the, in the county development plan to promote Dunleary as a 10 minute town but there's also wider objectives, including mobility, uh, climate action, and better public realm. As I mentioned already, there was a trial pedestrianization done in 2021. And the outcome of that research that was done was we recommended a permanent pedestrianization be progressed, but that we would look at the entire length of Georgia Street rather than just the section that was pedestrianized with a view to improving it. A further opportunity then became available as part, path, part of the Pathfinder application, which is a national a national fund that was made available through the Department of Transport. And the, that allowed us to expand it out into looking at the full living streets block. So during 2020, the late 2022 and early 2023, we did a pre-design um, phase to the project, which included public, public engagement. And we did all our studies and options assessment. And there was an information evening in the school. And, and we took that feedback and incorporated it into the permanent design. And we're at the stage now where the statutory consultation period um, is, is underway until the 14th of December. So during the consultation, we've made all the information available on the project. And the next steps, I suppose, is, is to, for us to complete the, uh, the feedback that we get into a report that's presented to the elected members. Uh, the current program is looking like that that would be in, in the council meeting in February. And at that meeting, then uh, the councillors would make a decision on the project. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to John Montgomery, and, and John is going to talk a little bit about the public realm improvements. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Connor. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen there. Um, so really, I suppose what we're doing here in terms of public realm and coinciding with the mobility improvements, uh, we found an opportunity to create enhancements to the public realm. So particularly around the scope of our area in around Georgia Street and extending right up to uh, clear in the park as well. And a number of the mobility uh, 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 nodes also. Um, this will go some way to regenerating the spatial experience of what's already a very, very special place. And to be clear, what we're trying to do here is create a coherent language uh, throughout Dunleary, which will complement that rich uh, character of the town and not compete with that very unique and distinctive architectural uh, heritage. Um, so along with the ideas of bringing better landscaping um, uh, street furniture, we're really trying to make a very welcoming, safe and vibrant environment for users of the town and attract people into it and make it very, very more successful than it already is. The uh, Georgia Street itself, Georgia Street Lower, we're obviously, uh, as Connor has uh, suggested already, we're proposing uh, to pedestrianise roughly around 220 metres, uh, linear metres of that space. So that's bookended really by Myrtle Square and Marine Road, the junction at Marine Road. Um, which kind of give quite a nice kind of natural start and ending point to that particular segment of it. Along the route itself, then you have these uh, nodes and kind of points of, of interest where we're able to create seeding opportunities, planting opportunities, which again, don't compete with the retail interests, don't compete with servicing or emer emergency vehicles trying to use the space um, and allow for that kind of fluidity of movement uh, and activity along the street itself. And I think with the success of Myrtle Square, the play elements and how well that's being used at the moment, this is a really nice way to kind of continue that uh, that theme of a uh, public open space and really celebrating those spaces as well. So looking at one of the, the key spaces along the route, uh, the route and we'll, we'll kind of zone in on a few of these. Um, the first area is Marine Road Junction. So just to orientate yourself, we have uh, St. Michael's Church here and the shopping centre uh, on the right hand side. Patrick seat, which uh, drops down to the end of the, uh, the page this year. Uh, one of the key moves, which some of you might be happy to hear, is that uh, the cobblestones on the junction will be uh, removed, which makes cycling a little bit more comfortable across those uh, cobbles. Um, the area around the edge of the church will be uh, integrated a little bit better into the public realm with some landscaping. Um, and then we find opportunities for pocket planting as well. And throughout the presentation, you'll see that wherever we have these pockets of landscape, what we're trying to do is um, enhance the visual amenity of the space, but also providing biodiversity opportunities through uh, native planting species, uh, capturing water for uh, use in suds, and that may infiltrate naturally back down into the ground to recharge the groundwater table um, on a very small scale. But all of these are moves are, are kind of positive moves in the right direction in terms of um, how we're developing our cities and, and our spaces as well. Um, one of the key areas, this is kind of, uh, I, I suppose, this particular point acts as a bit of a gateway, um, as a welcoming moment within the actual landscape and of Georgia Street, and always has. So it's that moment where people can kind of meet, um, where people can depart from, and, and becomes very recognisable as a landmark space and complements the areas around it. The view gives you some idea of some of the massing and how those spaces will come together. So it's really kind of tidying up uh, some of those spatial um, areas, uh, ensuring that we have access, uh, proper access, drop curves, tactile paving, et cetera, uh, throughout. And again, this is something that you'll see throughout the actual design itself as well. So there's uh, opportunities for uh, sculpture, again, seating with planting integrated as part of that. Um, and obviously some, you know, non-slip surfaces and, and surfaces which are of a very high quality, tying into some of the work that's already been done throughout the metals and along the seafront. So really in terms of inclusivity and, and accessibility, uh, we're reducing clutter around the streets. We've had a lot of um, consultation with various different user groups to so trying to remove street clutter whilst not removing the opportunity for uh, some uh, seating outside um, cafes and restaurants. Uh, cleaner, smoother surfaces, um, which tie into the wider uh, picture of Dunleary and the materials that are used. Uh, defined areas for retailers' furniture, as we've said already. Uh, the introduction of tapping lines uh, for visually impaired, and they're quite nicely tied into the actual overall design um, and methods that we've used before. 
Um, additional drop curves for those who are mobility impaired, and they'll be not just within the pedestrianized zone, but throughout the entire length of Georgia Street, upper and lower, um, as we move through. Um, obviously, tactile paving, uh, wider space pedestrianized areas. So all of Georgia Street, albeit it's been pedestrianized, it still has been designed to be serviced in particular hours and also uh, access for emergency vehicles as well. Um, this has all been reviewed um, by our access consultancy and audited as well. So we've had a number of iterations of this, of, of this design to ensure that it works um, and collaborated along the way with uh, the road engineers um, and other designers as well. And um, there'll be improved signage for wayfinding. Um, and then we'll also have an increased number of disabled spaces uh, from 12 up to 17. Just to kind of, I suppose, summarize those ideas and to give you an idea of what the actual pedestrianized street feel will be, we have um, two kind of ways of working this out. So we have our, our access along one side, which allows for deliveries, which allows for um, emergency vehicles running down along this side. So we've got sufficient width for that to happen. We define the edges of the streets with a, with a darker cobble. This just helps really practically with picking up any dirt um, that may accumulate as tends to, to do. And it's a very traditional approach to actual streetscape design as well. Uh, we anticipate that that will be a natural stone material. We're, we're looking at a much warmer uh, paver for the actual street itself. Um, and again, that's just to give a sense of warmth rather than having gray paving, which you know somewhat ties in with the many, many, many gray days that we have uh, aren't, aren't limited only to winter. So that helps give some some warmth, but again, it won't compete with the architecture. It actually works in quite a classical way. Um, and then throughout the street, down the center of the street, we've identified moments for people to be able to sit, to gather, to you know wait for people, um, and also you know opportunities for people to actually take uh, food and beverage, um, etc. So we see it as, a, as a great opportunity for it to add vibrance uh, to the space itself as well. Um, and then obviously we have uh, new planting um, integrated within the design as well. And as I said earlier, the idea of some of these planted spaces is that they'll take some of the water in there. They'll be very robust native plant species, not entirely, but uh, for the most part, um, and selected from um, also complemented with uh, plants from the pollinator plant. Um, so as I said, uh, the scheme itself, just as a, as a rendered eye level view, you can get a sense of how the scale of the space works how the paving is beginning to work and the choices of color are beginning to work with the actual buildings and the textures of the buildings, the planting, how that adds to the softening of the space, and then those opportunities for seating as well uh, for people to be able to use. Um, <clears throat> there'll obviously be more bike parking uh, within the, the street, and I saw a query about um, cyclists. So we would like cyclists um, and those on scooters as well to be able to dismount to obviously avoid as many conflicts as, as possible. So, you know, this is an early stage of design. So those final kind of elements of, of positioning of materials, of selection of street furniture, et cetera, will all be brought on in, in the next stages as we move through the design. Just as an example of one of the nodes that we were talking about earlier on, so you can see where we have Sussex Street and Convent Road kind of merging together as uh, Lower Georgia Street passes through. So this is a natural point for a change in texture, something interesting to happen within the actual paving itself. Um, in this way, it kind of slows people down a little bit, provides opportunity to move people up into Convent Road and, you know, look at what is some, some of those retail opportunities as well are as well. So real kind of value being added to the public realm and to retailers around it um, also. Um, and then we have Myrtle Square. So obviously the hospital is um, adjacent to Myrtle Square itself, and we've seen great success in that space and the big move in terms of urban design that has lended uh, to the area and to the shopping center also. I think what's really important here is to understand that St. Michael's Hospital will remain unimpeded in terms of uh, traffic access arriving into the actual car park and, and um, the hospital itself as well. So our pedestrianized area stops in this zone and we use kind of a, a, a raised table element just to define that and mark the end of that pedestrianized area regardless of the fact that our street improvements, paving upgrades, curbs, et cetera, um, and parking spaces continue on right down through to uh, through Dunleary itself. Um, 
Carnegie Library is another area that we've been looking at. I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity to be able to tie into something that's given so much, I think, in terms of uh, Carnegie to, to the town of Dundee as well. And really what we've done here is we've looked at the architecture in terms of a design intervention, and we tried to replicate that idea of uh, this very special roof light that they have, if you've ever gone there. But we tried to replicate that kind of radial, radial effect moving out from the space. It gives us quite a bit of flexibility in how the space is going to be used in the future, depending on how Carnegie Library is used as well. And also we took the idea of this was a library, so it's, it's a place of information, it's a place of knowledge. So we tried to take the idea of this kind of flickering book uh, effect um, in the actual paving design. Whilst we have these planters, raised planters with seeding opportunities as well, so there's plenty of flexibility in the design. Clearing the park, really uh, the opportunity here where we have the mobile filter was to begin to look at claiming back some of the park to its original footprint. So uh, there's a huge amount of car parking that spans its way into the original uh, park footprint. So you can see around the edges is where and where the trees are actually planted is where the uh, park was laid out formerly. This is just a, a shot looking back into the park. Uh, you can see there's a large amount of uh, tarmac atom in there. So the idea is to claim back this area, to soften it up, to, to provide those opportunities for planting, for biodiversity, um, and for, you know, importantly, for people, both of the local community, but of the wider community as well. Um, there's, a, there's been a huge consideration of its historical context and the importance of clearing clear the park. Um, and also in terms of how it came to be. So obviously the family who owned the actual house ran the quarry, which is uh, People's Park now. Um, so there's a very strong relationship in that respect of how it's, how it's actually uh, historically developed over time. And we didn't want that to be lost. So there's a big kind of, uh, when we look at the actual design itself, you'll see that kind of story of stone and rock and the importance of, of Dunleary Harbour and how we kind of beginning to tell that story in a very subtle way as well. The bottom right image here uh, is quite interesting in that it's uh, showing uh, one of the old railings and where the tree is, and the, the tree is actually grown to, to almost eat the, uh, the railing itself. So a fine example, I think, of nature overcoming um, our interventions. Um, in terms of considering the site, and this will go some way to explaining the actual design evolution, we have the topography of the site which, you know, it falls quite steeply um, from the top end down, right down to the bottom onto the corner um, over a couple of meters. So we have to consider those things, particularly when we're designing for access uh, and inclusivity as well. We're very conscious of microclimate, where are the places that are gonna, people can sit in the sun or avoid the sun if needs be, um, and also their prevailing winds as well. Currently access is around the actual site. There's clearly desired lines across it, which have been uh, adhered to and some of the design uh, evolution. And then, you know, we've got the idea of the existing trees and the aim here is to retain all of the existing trees, work with the levels around them and not just rub their root system as well. They've been there a lot longer than, uh, than any of us. Um, the overall master plan really looks at uh, how the park is laid out at the moment. So we've split it up into two sections. There's a very active zone around the tennis court, which obviously will be retained very, very popular in its use. Um, so around those areas itself, what we've done is we've tried to have more active uses. So we've got a small uh, kind of outdoor gym area with uh, bars, pull-up bars, that kind of thing to encourage uh, exercise. There's some very informal play, children's play um, associated with that. And then central to the scheme is the uh, opportunity for seating. So we've got seating on a large scale for people to be able to integrate and, and meet and provide opportunities for uh, interactions, which are really important um, nowadays. And then, you know, smaller areas for uh, chess tables or smaller picnic tables that people just want to be by themselves, which often we do. Um, then you have the opportunity for, you know, uh, bulls. And we're, we're conscious there's bulls ports around in the area. There's bulls ports uh, within Black Rock, there's bulls ports um, within the, the People's Park as well. And, you know, these are smaller interventions which aren't costly and they provide an opportunity where we're you know short on open space for people to use they give lots of options for people on a local scale uh, and on a wider scale to use also the second part of the site is much more informal than the house laid out so what we've done is with the levels we've tried to raise the actual lawn itself create a flatter area for for kickabouts 
But what it does is it enables this zone central to the park to expand out in times of gathering. So if there's any uh, moments of the community or wider community where they want to have events or anything like that, you get that flexibility of space. So it's a very flexible space. It's very calm. And then up against that actual boundary, we're using existing trees on the boundary, albeit not within our site as borrowed landscape. But we're adding to that by providing um, additional tree planting uh, and habitat. And this would be, you know, we would see this not being accessible by people, but more as a refuge um, for, uh, you know, uh, flora and uh, fauna as well. And um, so we've got, a, you know, a vast net gain for biodiversity in that respect. And just, you can see the difference in taking out the car parking spaces. And Rory will touch a little bit more on that. Uh, so we're looking at approximately 110 new trees in addition to the existing trees that we've planted. Um, and there'll be 202 parking spaces available on street in the wider area, including uh, clearing the park east, west and north compared to the previous 269. Uh, and some of the views there, so we have the gathering gardens, you know, where we have the, the bulls port, the chess tables, the uh, picnic tables, and then a, a kind of a central area. Again, we're always struggling with levels and we really want it. We have a huge desire to ensure that these spaces are accessible and not covered with railings etc and when we talked about touched on the idea of the craftsmanship of rock and that kind of element in terms of the family who who owned the park we have a kind of a, a little bit of a you know a very kind of raw subtle story about taking rock in its raw form, form and how we've been able to sculpt it into benches and cedars seats into steps um, and then in a more kind of contemporary manner as well so this is you know something that's very important in terms of when you look around um the cultural heritage that we have in our buildings um, around Dunleary also. Uh, we have the Great Lawn, as we touched on, so kick about frisbee, picnics, uh, dogs, etc. Oh, and also in the background of this image, you can see a, a rebound wall. So that could be an area for warming up for tennis or, you know, soccer ball for anything like that um, in advance of, of the match, etc. The woodland area, you can sign to see what we're, we're doing is additional tree planting, forest floor planting, uh, integrated opportunities for um, uh, B uh, hotels or, or bug hotels, etc. Uh, and then the idea of boulders, of, the, of uh, tree stumps, logs, etc. All of these areas that are kind of refuge and habitat for, uh, for insects, um, which are part of the greater ecological cycle. Um, the northeast entrance, just arriving, you can see the tennis courts, uh, some ideas on how we might kind of and screen those areas as well, uh, integrating these clip uh, elements into them. But also we have uh, rain gardens on the lower points of the park. So a lot of the water we'll try to gather that runs across the park, filter it before releasing it back um, and cleaning it up. But what that does obviously is provide immunity for, for ecology as well in the actual site. Um, so a huge amount of pollinator friendly planting, um, native planting, but not exclusively native as well. We do have to deal with the challenges in the climate change that we have right now. So looking for plants that are going to be drought tolerant in that as well and adding them to our palette also. Um, but to keep that idea of formality, you know, there are areas where we're trying to use lower formal hedges uh, to tie those spaces back in. Um, and I shall now, probably taken up enough time, I shall hand over to uh, Rory Collins and he'll discuss a little bit more on the mobile filters. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, John. I'll just uh, share my screen now. you can all see that. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the engineering and traffic related elements of the project. Um, first up are the modal filters, which are an important part of the project. Uh, just as a definition, a modal filter is a piece of infrastructure on a street that prevents the passage of car traffic, but allows pedestrians and cyclists through. Uh, modal filters are typically used to reduce traffic levels on certain streets, to increase safety, reduce noise and air pollution, and to encourage walking and cycling. Um, and we just have a short video about the installation of some of these in Dundrum that I'll, I'll play. 
So Knocknashi is a residential estate, 94 houses in South Dublin. But over the 20 years I've lived here, the traffic has just built up hugely. It was just a really terrible situation that was causing such upset to our residents. Many residents could get in and out of their houses. So before the, the traffic interventions, people would be taking shortcuts through the estate and at any given time of the day. So any time the children were on the green, I was always kind of nervous of them kicking a ball and the ball went onto the road that they'd go after it. So, so much so that I actually spent a lot of time standing out there on the road, you know, supervising them when they were out there. The number of interventions that have occurred at the, it was made crossroads at Tremarfum, which the council have had a uh, permanent closure of uh, the crossroads. And also there have been a number of sites within the estate where platter boxes have been placed in order to create a number of cul-de-sacs. I suppose, given where the boxes were going to be, we were slightly hesitant because my work is on that side and initially it put out door, it would have meant going the whole way around. Because we're the last house, it was probably going to inconvenience us a bit. Um, having said that, we found, quickly found a solution. I just park a wood car on the other side. If it's a, if I think it's a day, I'm going to need to be using that side a bit more. Now it's peaceful. It, it's a very pleasant place to walk around. Um, because there's no constant through traffic of cars. I'm a big cyclist um, and many people that I know have commented that they will bring their kids through this estate safely with their children on their bikes, which they wouldn't have done before. The estate is very quiet. I think the only traffic in the estate is actually residential traffic or people visiting. So it's been transformative to be fair. So the kids can go out and play, they, they're safe out there. To get across the road, you know, sometimes it's difficult. The danger from, I mean, I've eight grandchildren, they come here regularly, you know, like the estate has been transformed. I mean, you see it out there now, there isn't, there's no traffic, you know, it's, it's transformed. I mean, there's, there's much less air pollution, obviously much less noise pollution, and you definitely can hear the birds singing in the bees on me around, so yeah, if other people were considering doing this, I would recommend it absolutely, without a doubt. Um, so the three model filters that are proposed as part of this project, as uh, Connor discussed earlier, shown in those um, dark green dots, um, and they, they create um, what we're calling a living streets neighborhood, which is the block shown in the light green shading here. Um, the block is flanked by York Road, Tivoli Road, Carrick Road, Lenigiri Road Lower, and Georgia Street Upper and Lower. With significantly reduced traffic in this area, it'll become a more inviting place to be in, a safer place to move around on foot, bike, or on wheels. Modal filters will deter through traffic while still allowing destination traffic to the town and to the houses within the area. Uh, through traffic is a big contributor to traffic problems in Dunleary, with 59% of the traffic on Georgia Street Lower um, currently being through traffic. Uh, within the neighbourhood, people will still be able to drive to their homes to have visitors to receive deliveries and services. This is an aerial shot of the modal filter at Tivoli Road. So if you came to the top of the Patrick Street, you would no longer be able to turn right, you'd, you'd have to turn left. Um, here's a visualization of it. You can see um, this is a small parklet um, with a couple of trees and a, a bench are proposed there in, in what was currently uh, the middle of the road. This is the Cross Avenue filter um, and it's where Cross Avenue meets Patrick Street, the section of Cross Avenue that's currently uh, one way. Um, the combination of these two modal filters together prevents the use of Tivoli Road as a through route and will greatly reduce the traffic levels in the area. Um, again, a small park with trees and landscaping is proposed in what was the road. The third modal filter is at Clorinda Park. Uh, it's located on the northwest corner of Clorinda Park. It means that the only access to Clorinda Park would be via Carrick Road. People would enter via Clorinda Park West and leave via Clorinda Park East in a one-way loop. Uh, so the modal filter prevents the use of the area as a through route and would greatly reduce traffic volumes. Um, I'll now talk about, about the traffic modeling that was done as part of the design and the option selection process. So the, the team built a computer model of all the roads in the town, and this was used to test a variety of options. Extensive traffic counts were done at over 20 locations around the town to calibrate this model. 
Uh, these traffic counts were done in October 2022 and so represent the post-COVID traffic patterns. The modeling was a comprehensive exercise. It took over six months to, uh, to complete. Um, this table summarizes some of the options, um, basically just showing that a lot of different options were tested. Um, there was 15 different combinations of things. Uh, we plugged each uh, scenario into the model to see what the impacts would be for traffic in terms of queuing, journey times, uh, volumes of traffic, etc. The purpose of this exercise was to find the best arrangement of traffic management measures that could reduce the through traffic in the Living Streets neighborhood so that streets would become quieter and more suitable for safe and pleasant walking and cycling. The other key aims of the study were to ensure that access to all properties by car was maintained and that all junctions could operate within capacity without excessive delays for drivers. Uh, so what was the preferred option? Um, it involved the pedestrianization of Georgia Street lower uh, to the same extent as was done during the Summer Streets trial. It involved the introduction of the two modal filters um, that I've just discussed and the third modal filter at Turinda Park. It also involved reversing the direction of traffic on the coast road at Windsor Terrace uh, to make it northbound. Uh, this intervention allows the coast to be used as a through route um, and for cars to bypass a busy junction near the entrance to the People's Park. This will take pressure off that junction and reduce delays for cars and bus passengers. So here's a graph showing the volumes of the traffic that the model predicted. Um, there's a comprehensive modeling report available uh, with loads more details of this process as well. Uh, so as mentioned, the preferred option removes all through trips from the Living Streets neighborhood by closing off the presential routes. As a result, there's a significant drop in the levels of traffic predicted for these streets. Um, so for example, on Tivoli Road, the total daily car movements is currently 10,000 and is predicted to reduce to around 5,000. The traffic on Patrick Street, Mulgar Street and all other streets within the block is also significantly reduced. This table shows the predicted traffic levels on the roads around the edge of the block. So Georgia Street, Upper, York Road, Glengarry Road, Upper and Lower, and Crofton Road. Some drivers will be rerouted, and this means that the level of traffic will likely increase on these roads. These increases are mostly between 10 and 20%, although Crofton Road does see a larger increase than this. Uh, these numbers are predicted by computer software, and they depend on human behavior. If more people choose to walk or cycle, which we hope that they will do, then the numbers will be lower than this. So we use the model to test the impact uh, of this traffic on the roads and on the junctions to see what the impact on journey times would be. All of the junctions were modeled using specialist software. Um, and there's a modeling term for junctions called the ratio of flow to capacity. If a junction is at 90% of its total capacity, it is deemed to be full and then delays will start to significantly mount up. So while some junctions were found to get busier, they were all found to operate at less than 90% of their capacity, even at peak times. This means that only small increases in journey times are expected for drivers, typically two to four minutes in total at the busiest time of the day. And as part of this project, the traffic light timings at all junctions in the town will be reviewed and optimized to suit the new arrangements. So a summary of the findings from the traffic modeling, car movements within the, the area are significantly reduced with an average of 43% reduction in the Living Streets neighborhood. This facilita facilitates active travel by creating a network of streets with low levels of car traffic, significant reduction in harmful emissions and noise pollution. A, a redistribution of motorized vehicle traffic is expected, but all junctions were found to operate within capacity. I just talk a bit now about wayfinding and the impacts on buses. So the project facilitates destination traffic. The main routes into and out of the town remain in operation with no change in direction. This includes Clarence Street, York Road, Georgia Street Lower, the, the Monkstown end until the start of the pedestrianized area. Um, so the access to St. Michael's Hospital is still possible. 
uh, George Street Upper, Crofted Road, Marine Road, uh, and Queen's Road. Um, to reduce congestion at the Peebles Park Junction, as discussed, that direction of traffic will be reversed on the Coast Road. This has been done as part of a separate project on the coastal mobility route. Um, and to maintain accessibility for those who need to drive, the project will include clearer signposting and will communicate wayfinding options for visitors. So we've created a series of short videos uh, to explain how people would move around the area. Um, I'll just play a bit from one of them. There's other videos available showing how car journeys in different directions are, are affected. Um, so the, the project aims to make Dunleary Town a destination and not a thoroughfare. All the car parks in the town will remain open and their access is unaffected by the project. Um, and seven new real-time parking signs will be proposed um, at the following locations in, in the red dots on the map. Uh, these signs will be on the approaches to the town and will replace the existing signs sh uh, shown on the bottom right there. Um, monitoring equipment such as cameras will be installed in the car parks and each smart sign will display information on the number of spaces that are available at the various car parks in the town. Um, as George's Street Lower will be pedestrianised, buses will no longer be able to stop there. Let's play a short video on the, on the new bus routes. Well, I'll just pat you back, back to Ruth now, just to talk a little bit about the public consultation. Thanks very much, Rory, and hi, everyone again. So, as I said at the introduction, I work for a company called Emco, and we've been working with the broader team on public consultation for this project for over a year now. Um, and the last kind of intensive phase of public consultation we had was the pre-design engagement. And that started in winter last year, went through to the spring. And for this project, we've been really keen to engage with people in a variety of different ways. You, bearing in mind, not everyone has the same amount of time or knowledge or motivation to take part. So we had a multiple ways where we reached out to people. We held a drop in in the Dominican primary school, which we have another one taking place next week. We held a, a pop up webinar and an online survey. And we had really good engagement through those um, avenues. We had over 575 people participating in total. Um, we had over 12 individual meetings with local groups and really, I suppose, a huge volume of relevant feedback that was fed then into the design development process. For example, with regard to informing the different uh, design options for placement of modal filters, informing some of the design ideas for Clorinda Park and some key insights on improving urban accessibility. So it was a really iterative process. At the moment, we are in the part eight consultation period. Um, as I said, it's a six week process where we've leaflet dropped over 17,000 leaflets throughout the town just to raise awareness. We have a variety of social media posts going out over the, the, the coming weeks, posters throughout the town and newsletters, for example, um, articles in DLR Times newsletter and various residents associations newsletters. We have the online survey. 
which is up on Citizen Space and Africa, share the link and we'll share it again um, towards the end of the session. Next week, Tuesday, 28th of November, we have a drop-in, which is open for, to the public, just to call in whenever suits them between 5 and 8 p.m. in the Dominican Primary School. And we'll all be there um, just to, to have conversations with people on any queries they have on the project. <clears throat> we also held some workshops with the school uh, students today actually so we're engaging with the school because they're a key stakeholder in the area we'll be holding some pop-ups we held a pop-up in the lexicon library and we'll hold one uh, an outdoor pop-up uh, early in december we have hard copies of the surveys in the library because we recognize and everyone wants to um, complete forms digitally and we have had a series of meetings with stakeholder and residence groups um, over the last few weeks. And we'll probably have about up to about 13 by the time we're finished with that process. As Africa already posted, there is a variety of materials that you can kind of get stuck into. But I'm, 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 I'm sure by now we've, we've got a lot of questions coming through and we kind of want to get through to the, um, the question uh, piece of today. So just uh, we've grouped some common themes and I'm going to start by kind of going through those now and you can keep them coming but just to start with um one kind of key theme that came through was around cyclists and how they will integrate with the pedestrian area we have a question on whether or not cyclists will be allowed in the pedestrian area and um, on whether or not the cobblestones will be removed and I know that is something that's part of the project and another question around cycle routes that connect into cycle to school routes that Dunleary is already operating and safe streets to school. Connor, do you want to come in on that, those questions? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, so the, the answer to the question about the pedestrianisation, if it's a pedestrianised street, cycling is not permitted um, and scooting, electric scooting would not be permitted either um, because it would be it would be pedestrianised. So what we're trying to provide, and I think the challenge with, that we had with summer streets was that it was an attractive area for cyclists to use because they felt there was no other alternative and they were cycling um, illegally down the pedestrianized street. So what this plan does is that it, it, it provides alternative routes like Tivoli Road and obviously the coastal routes in place so that they, they these become attractive and safe routes for people to use to get around the pedestrianization. So if... Uh, but we do also want to make the town a destination point. So the, the cycle routes would lead to the pedestrianized street and then there would be cycle parking available at the edges. Um, but the simple answer to the question Ruth, is that it's it's illegal to cycle on a pedestrianized street. OK, uh, thanks, uh, Connor. There's a couple of questions around security and litter maintenance and, and maintenance of planting in the new areas, including Clorinda Park and on Georgia Street. Would you... Yeah, I can I can speak to that route. So th there's two things we have to do um, before the the project would go to construction. We have to agree a maintenance regime um, with our road maintenance department, and we also have to agree a, a maintenance regime with our parks department. Um, the, within the capital works of the contract, there's usually a, a post completion maintenance period that's put in as part of the works. It's usually one or two years, and maybe historically one of the issues is that there may not have been a budget available then for the host department to to take on the maintenance of these um the, of these projects and so what we've done is we've included within our climate action plan um obviously we are being encouraged to introduce suds and new uh, like sustainable drainage systems and um new tree planting which complies with our biodiversity and climate change objectives but brings with it additional maintenance requirements so within that, we've we've put forward as part of the budget this year a certain um, monetary value per kilometre of new piece of infrastructure that's put in, so that there would be a budget available to maintain these uh, for the service departments that would take them over after completion. Okay, thanks, Connor. There's a couple of questions around the positioning of modal filters, and uh, in particular the modal filter on Tivoli Road. Um, there was a query on what the purpose of blocking through traffic is on Tivoli Road. Why not have no right turn signs instead? Yeah, so they, uh, uh, Rory touched on it a bit. The, the purpose of, I suppose, the option on, on Tivoli Road at the moment is that it's not an attractive place, particularly for cyclists, because the volume and speed of vehicles is so high. So within within our objectives to reduce uh, to provide more equitable transport options for people and to reduce the car dominance of the area, the modal filters restricts through movement from one east east or west or west east, which reduces the volume to a level that makes it safe to cycle on road. Um, so then that 
also improves the the air quality and the noise pollution, which is again one of our climate change objectives. So it's the, the no right turn signs would stop people leaving Tivoli Road, but still maintain the volume, which is one of the things that we're trying to reduce. Okay, so there is a query linked to that. Then there's a query on whether or not the Tivoli Road filter will increase the volume of traffic on Glenagary Road Upper. Um, it says this is a, a key route for residents on Mulgrave Street to return to their homes. Mm -hmm. So Rory touched on it, Ruth, that there would be an increase on Glenagary Road Upper. And uh, the, the Dunleary Central project that had a chief part eight last year is proposing a change to that street as well. So within the traffic modelling work that was done, um, the, the changes to Glenagiri Road were incorporated into it. So the, the modelling exercise assumes or it redistributes traffic in a network. It doesn't assume a modal shift. So even within that context, it's still the junctions are still within capacity, obviously. And, and Rory touched on it. If there was a modal shift, which you would expect, you know, that people would start to walk and cycle more because there's less traffic on the streets, then um, the capacity would improve on those junctions. Okay, yeah, and that there were there were a few questions around that as well. So how how will increased traffic be accommodated, or will there be mitigation? I know there was a query on that junction of Glenagiri Road, Lower, and Carrig Avenue, and what the kind of treatment is there. Um, yeah, what's to... proposed at that junction is is a narrowing of the corner radii. At the moment, the the footpaths there are very narrow, so they they reducing the radius on the corners provides more space for pedestrians, uh, particularly that's a route to schools. Um, so there. You know, if the east-west traffic is reduced as well, there'll be further opportunities for signal optimization for people on Glenagiri Road lower to try and reduce congestion there. Um, but the, there's no lanes being removed or turning movements being removed, but the space for pedestrians has been improved. Okay, thanks, Connor. Um, a query on whether or not the modal filters will be initially temporary and could they re be removed if it isn't seen to work out? So the this uh, project is being progressed as a part eight. So it's a, it's essentially a planning. It's not a planning application, but it's it's a permanent scheme that's voted on by the elected officials. So once the scheme is approved, it has to be installed uh, as per the part eight. So if that if there was something to be changed, then it would require it. Depending on the measure, it may require another part eight to change it. So it's it's not um, some some legislation allows for more flexibility for putting things in and taking things out. Um, but for something like this with large scale mobility changes, it would it would need to be in place for a number of years before you could assess whether or not it's had an impact. Um, but but essentially, once the plan is approved, if it's approved, that would be installed as per the part eight. OK, and there was also a query on the modal shift in, and that was kind of woven into that traffic modeling, the assumed modal shift. So the traffic modelling, uh, the initial pass of the traffic modelling assumes no modal shift. So it assumes all vehicles will continue to drive and that they know the most efficient way to get around. But within the modelling exercise, we did do um, two, we did two tests of modal shift based on on three things, on the summer streets, the percentage of, of modal shift during summer streets and information from Barcelona and London. So that's, we're not basing our decisions on that but we did include um a percentage of modal shift to give a sense of what it could be like if it if it returned to similar levels during summer streets okay i'm going to move on to some questions around parking in clorinda park now so some people were wondering about where are the car parks going and i think maybe there is a confusion that there will be no car parking but there is on street car parking um, and people were wondering about the ratio of residence parking permits to other visitor parking permits. Yeah, so the it's proposed to reduce the parking by about 25% in the current plan. Um, that's obviously the, the, the car parking within the park boundary would be removed, but it, we were placing more parking on street. So there was there, I think it's um, from memory, it's 202 spaces in the proposed plan. So there is less than 200 parking permits for residents in that area. I know there was a figure circulating that there was 330, but apparently that that included expired permits as well. So there, that's assuming every single resident parks there every single night, um, which is not the case, obviously, because the car parks aren't completely full every night, but there would, there would be still more parking than there are permits. Okay, and then, and then linked to that, there's a query on whether or not any studies have been carried out on possible impacts to local business on the traffic that does use that the Clarinda Park, so not the visitors, but the, uh, not the residents, but the visitors. So the, the destination traffic is maintained. 
-hmm. So it's it's only strategic traffic or through traffic that would be diverted. So if somebody is currently, say, using Clorinda um, to park their car at the weekend, to go, that that is still an option for them. And um, so that that's not that wouldn't be changed. OK, emergency access uh, was a query. So whether or not emergency vehicles could pass the through the modal filters um, and the and the pedestrian area. So the, the emergency services along the pedestrian high street is maintained uh, throughout. So that's 24 seven. And we met with the fire services last week to discuss that. So we've um, they've given us specifications for particularly large vehicles that we're just double checking to make sure everything can be accommodated along the street. So that that would be also for emergency vehicles going to the um, to the hospital. So then the modal filters there, there, there is um, they can be facilitated with smaller emergency service vehicles like guard the vehicles and ambulances, but the very large fire station vehicles wouldn't fit through all the modal filters. So we, we raised that with the fire services last week and we have to we have to provide them with a map. And the, their initial reaction was that it wasn't going to impact their their journey because they're coming from um Kill Avenue at York Road. So they but we're going to confirm that with them. They can be designed to take the large vehicle, but that would reduce some of the planting in them. Okay, thanks. So Query, this is kind of urban design, I don't know, it might be for, for you, John, it's around bridging gullies at the top of Marine Road. So this person says, my sister's in a wheelchair and finds it difficult to use crossings where there are gullies. And um, could they be bridged just at the crossing point? Yeah, that's a detail that's going to be uh, taken away regardless throughout the actual design. So yeah, it won't be one to, to worry about. And we'll have another audit of the accessibility um, before uh, the detailed design is completed. Okay, could I, yeah, and there, there's another sorry, Ruth, could I could I yeah. add to that that there is at the moment there's a curved channel that sits at the edge of the road and that runs down the length of Georgia Street as well. So that's a drainage channel. Um so that's that's been removed as well. That wouldn't be in the in the permanent scheme as proposed. Uh, I know that does cause issues. Um so uh, as apart from the gully gratings that would be, you know, for the, the drainage, there was this curved channel that is used throughout the street that would be removed. Okay, thanks, Connor. And and someone makes a suggestion here, which is um, you know, a useful one saying worth having a summary list of the new considerations and improvements for those requiring mobility aids. So just to kind of demonstrate the access features. So that's something we could look at. Yeah, that that's a fair point, Ruth. And we met the Dunleary Disability um consultation group last week as well, where um they're they're a local group to provide feedback. So we had met them during the pre-design engagement and we've presented to them last week. So we got some very useful feedback from them as well about, you know, different tactile layouts and um issues around mobility. So it's it, it, that that feedback is valid, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, query around, this is Irish Rail now, accessibility in town of no use to wheelchair users on cyclists arriving by DART. The lift is not working and no way of bringing bikes up to the street level unless carried. Um, I mean, that's an Irish Rail. I'd say that that would be an yeah. issue for Irish Rail, but I'm yeah. not sure. Are yeah. they considering allowing um, passenger access out onto the lower, in, you know, into the harbour? I think there is an option there to, to get into the harbour, but I think that's something we could refer on to Irish Rail route. Okay. Um, this is queries around outpatients appointments in St. Michael's Hospital um, uh, in the absence of the bus stop being there directly outside and outside Argos. Um, so the, the majority of people, the, the hospital survey that we did, Ruth, the majority of people are travelling to the to the hospital by car. So car access is maintained either from Georgia Street from the Carnegie Library end, that's two-way traffic up to the hospital, or you can enter the hospital from Crofton Road or indeed to um, George's Place. So you, you wouldn't be able to drive along Georgia Street, the area that's pedestrianised, but, but the access points are all being maintained. Okay. Um, people coming out of Tesco Bloomfield, how, what is the option for them to, what's the nearest bus stop for them? Um, this is just people going shopping, I suppose, at that end of the town. What would the nearest bus stop, is that it's Crofton Road, would it be? It, it depends which bus they'd be yeah. getting routes, but it, it's it's either Marine Road, um, where you know that you'd be getting the seven, or it's York Road, um, for the forty six A or seventy five. Okay, I have a query on from a resident on Carrig Avenue, wondering about possible traffic impacts on Carrig Avenue, and um, likewise for for Crosswaite Park, um, and Myrtle, uh, sorry, and um, Mulgrave Street. And might, maybe Rory might have some kind of figures that could speak to that or. 
Um, I don't have the numbers for, for every street to hand, yeah. but um, typically every street within the block sees a reduction of around about 40%. Yeah. Those directly on the edge um, have an increase of about 10 to 15, and then those further afield, um, there's limited change. Okay, and Crossway Park, particularly concerned about rat running, has that been looked at as part of this project or is there any kind of plans to 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 mitigate potential rat running impact? Uh, I, I could take that one, Ruth. So the, the, the rat running or the, the, the suggestion of rat running in Crossway is to avoid Glenagiri Road lower, you know, to try and get time advantage into the town. So one of the things we are doing is to try and improve or reduce the congestion on Glenagiri Road lower. And that's one of the reasons why the, the one way along the coast was reduced. And the additional modal filter in Clorinda Park then reduces the opportunity for people to come through Crosswaith and then through Clorinda and up to Georgia Street. Um, but that that is something that we've heard um, from other groups during the consultation to date. So there there is opportunities there to do measures in Crossway Park. I suppose if people feel that that's something that they wanted to consider, it would be important to include that in your submission. Okay, and um, this is maybe from the previous batch of questions, which was on traffic within the Living Streets neighbourhood. Uh, questions on Patrick Street and people not understanding how that won't see an increase in traffic. But I think Rory, what you're saying was there will be a, a predicted decrease across the neighbourhood. Yeah, so the model just assumes that everybody wants to drive everywhere the quickest. Um, so this Patrick Street wouldn't be the quickest route for people. So it wasn't it was showing a reduction um, on okay. that route. Okay, question again, maybe this might be for you, Rory. It's the Myrtle Square vehicle access. So will vehicle access to Convent Lane from Myrtle Square reopen since it was closed due to the bollards being knocked, it says? Um, um, so Convent Lane is part of the Myrtle Square project. Um, yeah. I, I don't think vehicle access is, is being returned there apart from the larger vehicles the that will use it to make deliveries to Bloomfields. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm just looking at some queries here and traffic modeling took place in 2022 while the temporary coastal route was in operation and now that the planning has gone on board, okay. can you predict what the traffic plan will be for, sorry, this is a confusing question. I'm not, I'm gonna skip on some, I'm gonna come back to that one in a second. Um, I, I could do yeah. it a route, I, I had read it yeah. in the chat there. So the, yeah. what, it's, what it's asking is, how could we make a decision on this project if there's a question mark over the coastal route project? Mm. Um, I suppose this project is not connected to the coastal route, in, mm. as in that they stand alone and they're two separate, they're two separate things. In terms of the reference to onboard Planola, um, they, they were saying that they would have a decision early next year, but but whether so if if the board was to rule that an EIA was required, then we would make that submission, um, and then the board would be deciding on the outcome. But, you know, in line with policy objectives, you, you would expect that that would be something that would be approved. So it's not, it doesn't go back to square one as such. Um, but I suppose the projects stand on their own two feet. If if the coastal route, for the sake of argument, was removed tomorrow, that wouldn't change, the, you know, the opportunity to improve the town as part of this project. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Connor. A uh, question, question on whether or not the assumptions used to build the traffic modelling are available for inspection. So I think the full traffic modelling report is a as a, an appendix in the options report, uh, Rory and, and, and Connor, which is online, which yeah. is on the citizen space. Yeah, it's, it's about 100 webpage. pages, Ruth, and it does yeah. go through when the data was collected, how it was collected, you know, what assumptions. It, it covers everything in terms of the traffic modelling. It's it's a good reference. Okay. Um. A query on whether or not we considered making Tivoli Road one way towards Dalkey to counter the one way along the coast. Uh, we did. Uh, I mean, that's an option that's looked at in the, in the options report. Um, so you can have a look at the options report and it goes through w one of the big issues with making it one way. Um, there isn't it, there isn't an opportunity to provide cycling in both directions if you make it one way because it's too narrow. And one way wouldn't reduce the volumes enough that you could have integrated cycling on road. So that was that was one of the reasons. But it, it is dealt with in the modeling report and the options report. Okay, and that maybe there's a similar answer to this question, which was on the will the increase using Windsor Road with the increase of people using Windsor Road, will there be a negative track traffic impact in Glassdool, e.g. at the Glassdool Road Link Road Junction? Uh, no, I don't think so, Ruth, because the 
the traffic passing through Glass Tool stays the same. So rather than continuing west on Summerhill Road, they'll have the option to to use Windsor Terrace. So it doesn't it doesn't increase traffic. It's the same traffic, but it's it's splitting it over the two roads. So you have two opportunities to go west rather than one at the moment. Okay, this is a question on traffic light sequencing. Um, will this include making the time allotted for pedestrians to cross much longer than they currently are? So talks of traffic changes in the sequencing, what specifically is changing there? Yeah, so the, with any new junction, the signaling gets, so there's an overall signaling plan done for the optimization and the traffic modeling. But then if the junction is changing or the width of the crossings are changing, then the timings for pedestrians change also. So that it gets a new program for a new junction. Okay, because we have a query here on this idea of kind of micro mobility or an electric bus or something to um, connect people up to the town who might have maybe been getting the bus or people who can't get close enough to the main to the pedestrian area. Has that been looked at or is that included in the plans? So the provision of a bus is, isn't in this plan, Ruth. We did look at it as part of the option to get passengers or customers to the hospital, but the the transport survey we did with the with the hospital um the patients of the hospital there was no demand for it there wouldn't be enough people using a bus to get to the hospital to warrant as part of this project so a lot of the feedback we've gotten from groups to date is there seems to be an appetite for a bus more generally in the town um and also within Dunleary, some of our departments have indicated a preference to look into it in more detail so why it's not part of this project as in it's not part of the part eight. Um, I think we will look into it in more detail to see can it be included as part of a recommendation. Um, so there's a bit of work to do on it because, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it would become something more than the living streets. It, it may become a bus that would be used for, you know, arguably going to the 40 foot or as far as Monkstown or bringing passengers from, you know, cruise ferries around the town. So it's it's bigger than this scheme, but we'll do some work on it before we come back with the part eight. Okay, and a query here on the budget for this project, and is it EU money? Uh, no, it's not EU money. It's 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 funded. It's uh, not Irish money, but it's it's within the Irish the uh, government system. Sorry, not EU money, Ruth. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, we see anything to counter illegal parking on the path in Clorinda Park. Will there be any enforcement of illegal parking in the area when these changes are introduced? Well, enforcement is uh, the parking wardens that report to our parking section are, are will are required to enforce the parking in the in the pain display. So that would continue. Um, so if if there are issues with illegal parking, we can ask them for increased enforcement in those areas. Okay, and a question on deliveries. So how delivery trucks will deliver to stores on the pedestrianised area of Georgia Street Lower, and also what is the time frame for the pedestrian works themselves? to physically build it uh, I think yeah I think yeah. that's what it means yeah yeah so the, what's proposed within the part eight is that loading on the street would be allowed up until 11 um so vehicles could come along the street and there are areas between the proposed planting and seating for vehicles to pull in and load um so then after 11 there are loading base the perimeter so there's one at Sussex Street one at Convent uh, Road and then one down at the Myrtle Square end so they would they would at that stage if it's outside of eleven o'clock they would have to use um, you know hand trolleys if there are larger deliveries. Uh, in terms of construction, uh, the we sort of our estimate at the moment that the project could take up to two years to construct. Okay. Yeah, just to clarify that that uh, bigger vehicles and fire brigades are able to use uh, George Street Lower the sufficient space for them to get down that section. OK, thanks, Rory. And a query on whether or not minor road junctions will have continuous footpaths with zebra crossings added, such as at the top of Clorinda Park, on Tivoli Road and the top of Patrick Street, etc. So there are new crossings proposed, um, but not every junction has a crossing. Um, but again, if that's feedback that people feel it's warranted, that's something that could form part of their submissions route. OK, yeah, query on whether this might be the same answer that you're going to give to this query on whether or not traffic calming measures on York, Corrig and Mulgrave Street um, can be part of the plan. Speeds on York Road especially are pretty bad. Um, I mean, I suppose they are part of the plan because it's going to be quieter in Mulgrave, et cetera. Um, yes, yeah, so, so within the block, the traffic volumes yeah. will be much less. So that really the only people that, that would be driving around um, would be residents or some of the destination traffic, so that the volume would be much lower. 
Um, on York Road, it is proposed to put a pedestrian crossing on York Road to help people cross the road there. Um, but again, if more crossing points are, are people feel that they're needed, then that's something that could be in their submission. Okay. Um, we're here on the planning process. And does this go to onboard Planola for approval? or just uh, generally right down County Council. And then there was an earlier query I'm going to bring up, which was similar. And it was, is the councillor meeting something the public can be at to express our thoughts on the scheme? So just, yeah, around the process. Okay, so the, the Part 8 process is, um, it's one that's in the Planning Act and the executive and this project team have proposed a plan that's out to public consultation. So our role now is to, take all of the feedback that comes through the submissions and to prepare a report and what's called a chief executive's recommendation. And we present that to the councillors. So then within that recommendation, um, we could recommend a lot of things on photo feedback. It might be to add something to the project or to remove it, um, or indeed to abandon the project could be the recommendation. So the councillors then, they have three options. They can accept the recommendation in the plan, i.e. approve it. They can reject it entirely, or they can amend the plan by motion. So that happens at the council meeting, which is a public meeting. <clears throat> so the public are allowed to attend the council meetings. Um, I think you have to have an invite from a council. The, the public gallery is quite small, but it's um, there's no interaction from the public at a council meeting. It's it's obviously a meeting for the councillors, but the public are able to attend and it's webcast as well. Okay, great, Connor. I think that's, given that it's quarter past eight and we've gone over our time a bit, we seem to have covered off some of the main themes there that have come through. Uh, we do have an FAQ up online that actually covers off some of the queries that have already been posted here. We will review that and also the full list of questions. And if there are any additional questions that we feel haven't been answered, we can post a document to the Citizen Space uh, webpage. And I'm pretty sure we'd have email addresses that we could email it on to people if we feel that there were some that hadn't been addressed now. But I think um, we've had a good session there. And as Connor said, we are in the middle of this part eight process. So, so many of the comments really were comments that should be made through an official submission online on, on, on the citizen space or via email or via letter or via some of our post boxes in the libraries in Dunleary. Um, I think we have given you all the information there, hopefully that you will need to kind of have better knowledge on the scheme. Please do check out some more of, of the details on the page. If anyone um, knows people who might be interested, there is the drop in next week, which is Tuesday in the Dominican school. And hopefully we'll see somebody there and look forward to receiving your submissions. And thank you all so much for your time. And thanks to the panelists as well.